Hello, uh, this is Amy and I am back. Uh, I told you I was done for the year, but you know what? Just, I, I try to, to get myself out, but then you always pull me back in. That's because the second season of his Dark Materials uh, or series, if you want to be British, uh, premiered in America finally, even though this one over here in Western Europe gets it a week before I did. So I had to wait uh, and then I asked Lo to come on to talk about it. So I'm really, really excited for that. So I'm gonna just start by saying content warning. Um, we're gonna talk about season two. So if you haven't seen season two, don't watch this. Or if uh, you don't care about spoilers, then watch this. But spoilers all, uh, Lo and I have also read the books. So, uh, you know, some of our uh, commentary might be slightly, uh, you know, have to do with the subtle knife, the book. So also be warned of that too, but this is gonna be mostly about the show. So don't worry about that. We're not going to uh, read the book to you or anything. Um, but you know me, Lo, I love to give my plugs out of the way really quick. So tell us what's going on at your blog and what you're working on. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Lo. Uh, and uh, some of you might have seen me on Amy's uh, channel before. Uh, but I also have my own WordPress, uh, lodelinks.wordpress.com, where I've been analyzing this season of Historic Materials episode per, by episode. And uh, I'm also doing uh, A Song of Ice and Fire stuff on there, which I think will be the next thing I have coming up. And um, let's say about virginity in uh, A Song of Ice and Fire and how it's a patriarchal construct that oppresses women. <laughs> and then I'm doing an HDM ep uh, book essay uh, about uh, moving through unsafe spaces uh, as a marginalized person in society, basically. It's gonna be very dusty, uh, Book of Dust spoilery, um, but I have lots of non-Book of Dust things if on my blog, if anyone wants to read that too. Yes, Lo has some amazing analysis, everyone. So if you want those sweet, sweet episode by episode breakdowns, they've done some really great stuff. If you're a Song of Ice and Fire fan, they've done some great stuff with Sorella slash Alaris. Uh, they've done the Bere lots of Brienne stuff. Uh, one episode on, uh, pardon me, <laughs> that's my channel. <laughs> you're, you're, you just right. Uh, one uh, essay on uh, Brienne and Arya that I really appreciate. Um, so yeah, they have a lot of stuff going on. Uh, if you are into uh, questions of gender, uh, hopefully you should be because you're on my channel. Uh, you know, you are watching my channel, so you should be because I am. Uh, so yeah, what really endeared me to Lowe in the first place was their focus on gender studies, which is what I do in my studies as well. So um, definitely check that out. Um, okay, I'm gonna keep this as quick as I can because it's the end of the year. So I've got to talk about what's coming up for 2021. So I'm going to continue with my Song of Ice and Fire um, analysis, which is my main deal. Um, you know, you can find that over on my blog if you want to read it. But I also read every essay to you on this channel. And usually I have some uh, friends on to talk about it. For example, just did an essay with Lo over here. Uh, on less, we co-authored it on my Sono Mar, uh, the very, uh, very minor character that pops up in the fifth book. Um, so please check that out. We had a really, really great discussion. And I think that um, questions of queer sexuality um, and the binary are sometimes missing from the fandom. And I think we uh, really kind of got into some, uh, you know, scratched the surface of some issues, but I think we also really got into a lot of issues more deeply. So I really, really would love for you guys to check that out. I also uh, love the torture of just having co to constantly do things. So I started a, a monthly <laughs> series called Buddy Banter. Uh, where I have a friend pick a topic and they come on to talk about it. My first episode is uh, up on my um, channel and I did that live. So please, please hit that subscribe. I've got a little icon right there in the bottom right corner. And then if you hit that bell, you'll know when I'm going live. If you follow me on Twitter, you'll know, trust me, you'll know <laughs> when I'm going to do things. I plug all of my stuff on my Twitter. Uh, but if you're not on Twitter, that's okay. You've got YouTube to help you out and let you know when I'm going live. Um, and so, yeah, so I talked with John about gender stereotypes and how that affects the kind of media that we consume. Uh, and next month, so January, I think I'm going to have my friend Micah on. And then February, Lowe's going to be back to talk about whatever they want to talk about. So that's going to be exciting. So I've got buddy banter coming. I'm going to start some analysis of The Witcher, Avatar Last Airbender, and The Poppy War. And Lowe is going to come back to talk about The Poppy War with me because, yes, they've read it. Thank you. And you, you need to read The Poppy War you watching right now. 
amazing fantasy series. You don't need to understand Chinese culture to enjoy it, right, Lo? No, I I have a very like uh, basic understanding of Chinese culture, but I really appreciate it anyway. So uh, yes. it's amazing. So you know, put to, we're going to put together Lo's love of fantasy and my love of fantasy. Plus, uh, as many of you know, I'm a PhD student studying. Chinese literature, so this is my jam. So um, that is all coming up, all of that. But you're here because you like His Dark Materials. So what am I going to do next year with His Dark Materials? I have so far, and I mean so far because you know how I am. So far, I have uh, three essays planned. And um, one of them is going to be about Mary Malone and how she talks to dust using the I Ching, which is a uh, very traditional Chinese text. Uh, that is very well ingrained into Chinese culture, um, especially when it comes to fortune telling, mysticism, spiritualism. So you might be watching going, okay, she's like reading this, you know, randomly translated Chinese book, but you don't know. <laughs> I'm geeking out, I'm going to geek out about it and talk to you about why that is really significant and what Philip Pullman is doing there. So there's another essay I'm going to come out with, which I hope Lo will join me for because they have a lot of culture thoughts. I'm going to write an essay about... Um, Marissa Coulter and specifically the kind of monkey, de demon monkey kind of trope uh, in mythology, which I've talked about when in regards to Tyrion from A Song of Ice and Fire. So gonna, I've already done research for that last uh, essay about monkeys, which was my first ever essay, actually. Um, so I'm going to apply a lot of what I learned to uh, Marissa Coulter. And then last but not least, I'm going to talk about shamanism and his dark materials. I covered that a little bit in the essay and video that I did with Lo um, about Orientalism and colonialism in his dark materials. Um, and I'm going to kind of, so, but in this essay, I'm going to focus specifically on the Tartars and shamanism and kind of the mysticism of that, um, rather than just uh, being like, that's Orientalist. <laughs> um, and please do check out that video with me and Lo talking about colonialism and Orientalism. I'm going to have the link to that in the description. Um, but other than that, I am on other channels. Um, Bleep the Patriarchy, the second episode has been rescheduled to February. We're going to have Low on, and we're pretty sure we're going to talk about the binary and why it's bullcrap. So that's going to be really fun. Um, so it's going to be February 10th. So please subscribe to the Unspun Yarn to check that out. Um, link is in the description. And every Saturday, I'm on John Webster Film at 7 p.m. Eastern. We talk movies. January, we're going to be talking Wonder Woman 1984, Mean Girls, um uh oh my gosh uh the first x-men movie and pan's labyrinth and a dangerous method so lots going on because there's five saturdays in january so that is all my thing all links in the description Lo, let's get to this yes. topic because we are talking the second season of his dark materials based on philip pullman's the subtle knife um and because we read the books, we knew it was going to happen, but this is, of course, an adaptation. So there were still some, um, I don't want to say surprises, but kind of um, little quirks that were really uh, fascinating and that I enjoyed. Um, but maybe first we can just start by talking about improvements from season one. And one of the first things that I noticed is they have a bigger budget and it shows. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. You could tell yeah, that yeah. with uh, a lot of the things in general, but just demons, better demons, more demons. You mean you can actually see the demons? They're actually yes. there? What? Yes. <laughs> yes, the demons are present and all of the characters in Lyra's world, you know, they in the first season, you just kind of assume they were hanging out somewhere else <laughs> sometimes. Uh, and this, we really got to see them because, you know, they are the souls of people. So we want to see them constantly following their person. Yeah, exactly. And you could all also, I think, see their expressions quite a lot. Uh, I noted this a lot with the mon monkey in particular. Just yes. the monkey was so much more expressive and just brilliant in so many ways. Yes. And, you know, you could also see whenever Coulter would do something. Um, and the, the, the demon, the, the monkey demon, who doesn't have a name, it's really the only non-named demon, um, would react to her. And we did get that a little bit in season one, of course, uh, but I thought that it was just brilliant the way that they integrated. It's kind of, um, it, it really, to me, and we'll, we'll definitely get to culture, mm -hmm. but to me, just like 
one simple, one quick thought is that it really showed her self hatred this season. The way that she treated her demon shows how she treats herself in her own mind, and I, that's mm. why I love the series so much. Is that it really shows kind of, and why I want to write an essay about her and her <laughs> demon is it really shows uh, the person's kind of uh, psyche and what they're kind of going through. Yeah, exactly. Uh, which is why the demons are so important to the story. Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so we've got the the demons right um, are obviously there. They're present. They look better. Got better expressions, like Lo was saying. Um, I also thought the acting improved in general, pretty much across the board. Um, I I don't mean to be like critical, but I would say Ruth Wilson, who plays Coulter, is probably the one character who was consistently good every single episode uh, and every single scene. Whereas, you know, um, I know a lot of these, especially the child actors, are pretty new. And so there were a couple of scenes that felt off to me. But this was just like a banger every single episode with the acting. Mm. Yeah, uh, I know uh, one of the pod- His Dark Material podcasts that I listen to, uh, the Dark Material podcast, they always have like a cast award poll thingy on Twitter. And after a while they were like, should we just not have Coulter on the poll because she just wins by a landslide every week. Um, yeah. So, I mean, she, she's amazing, brilliant, fantastic. Yeah. She really embodies um, the character. I would say if I had to vote like most improved, honestly, it would be Lin-Manuel. Um, <laughs> Cause I was really not necessarily feeling him as Lee Scoresby and that's nothing to do with, you know, uh, you know, unfortunately because of the way that fandoms are, a lot of people were like, but he's from Texas and that, blah, blah, you know, he should, and a lot of people pictured him white and it's like, dude, lots of people in Texas are Hispanic, get over it. Um, it wasn't that, and I love, obviously, I, I'm a Hamilton fan, um, but I just, it felt a little awkward in the beginning, uh, in the first season, and the second season, especially when he interacts with Hester, felt so natural this season. Yeah, that was amazing. And Cristela Alonso, who plays Hester, is just brilliant. I love her. She's perfect as Hester, uh, especially yes. with that dynamic with them, like joking with each other and teasing each other and supporting each other. It's just brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, and I think the voice acting is also something we definitely have to give a shout out for because they are mm. part of the show just as much as, um, you know, the, the live actors are as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but is there anything else about uh, season two that you thought improved from season one? I don't know if improved improved but like the intro uh, i just gotta shout out the intro they've changed it up a bit and throughout the season you sort of figured out what everything was yes. um i know in the beginning i was ar- arguing with some people about uh one part of the intro that i thought was the the cave from mary's cave and some people were like no but that looks like a bomb and i'm like no but it's the cave and then it was the cave and I was very proud Pat of myself. Pat yourself on the back. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and then... Yeah, like, and those the, the dust. Those you're going to find out what the cave is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, and just like... The, you, you used to saw so many things throughout the season, like the, the dust things yeah. uh, that, were, that, that you saw in the cave and just forming symbols and just... The intro was amazing last season and maybe even better this season. Yeah. I actually, I mostly skipped it first season, but I watched it every single time second season. I really liked it. I know, I know. <laughs> bad, bad Amy. Um, but I, I, what I really appreciated about the opening is kind of how the worlds are chopped up and then they're horizontal and then they get vertical. And it really reminds me of string theory, which is something that Philip Pullman is very interested in uh, and is obviously inspires this story about multiple yeah. worlds. Um, so I found that really interesting, uh, definitely. Um, so yeah, uh, what next? Do we want to talk about new characters? Do we want to talk about Chitagaze? What do you want to talk about next, Lo? Oh, I don't know. Maybe just, yeah, Chitagaze, because that's such a meeting point of all the new characters. Yes, definitely. So we have this kind of um, Italian-like society, mm. and it's this what you know once we find out once vibrant city uh kind of out on the ocean and you notice the tour de angeli the tower of angels is kind of the center of this whole society 
Um, and you know, when, uh, when Will and Lyra first go there, they notice that, uh, that everything looks like it's stopped and it kind of becomes a little bit of a, uh, detective mystery in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that town is so interesting because like you say, it obviously has Italian influences with the names, uh, but also, um, I know that, um, uh, the people writing and designing said that it had like Spanish and North African influences. To me, it really reminded me of Southern Spain, uh, which has uh, Islamic influences uh, back from before the Catholics took over. Um, and yeah, it really remind it's like a melting pot of everything. Uh, and I mean, Sidagasi means, if I'm not mistaken, the city of the magpies. Because hmm. they literally steal things and bring thing different influences into the city. Interesting, so, it's yeah. like a hodgepodge. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, the tower is the center because that's sort of the center and the reason for the the city and the world being like it is. Exactly, and I actually was really impressed by the design of the angels outside of the tower. They obviously took a lot of care with the effects on this. Um, and it, to me, at least, it was almost exactly as I imagined it. And I'm not really necessarily a purist when I'm a reader. Uh, and then there's a show. But when something does look really similar to how I pictured, I am kind of happy. <laughs> um, yeah. So I was really pleased with it. And I was pleased with kind of the overall feel of Chitagaze, too, when they were just walking um, you know, down the uh, the alleyways and such, and the, the way that the houses were all kind of, if you notice, it's it's like San Francisco, and then there's not much room. So mm -hmm. they are, so you notice all the houses here in Gitagaze are kind of like built up, right? You're constantly going up, um, which is why it's interesting that then the Tour de Angelique kind of is above everything else, right? If you notice, nothing is taller than the Tour de Angelique. Um, no, which I find exactly. Really interesting. And it also kind of gives a uh, Tower of Babel vibe to it, I think. Uh, and obviously, in that, I'm not I'm not a uh, expert on anything Christian, but uh, from my understanding, uh, that uh, world essentially became cursed in a way because they tried to reach too far, uh, and that's sort of what happens with Shitagetsi too. Yes, that's true. And you know, obviously. Um... If you're a show only watcher, you you may be like, huh, I wonder if there's some religious symbolism going on. And if you're a book <laughs> reader, you definitely know there is. And the and trust me, season three is gonna get into that way more. Philip Pullman is very interested in religion. Um, and specifically kind of the control of religion over a society. So um, we'll get back to Chita Gazi, but let's talk a little bit about the Magisterium. Because yeah. you have written and talked to me quite a bit as well about kind of the magisterium as um, this kind of uh, kind of religious control, thought control over a, and military control, quite frankly, um, mm -hmm. over Lyra's world. Um, and I know that's also something you've written about in your colonialism essay as well. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so I, I, I generally see the magisterium as a sort of uh, pan-European colonial force that tries to control uh, both, yeah, like thought uh, and religion and everything in society. And as you can see in this picture, uh, I, I thought in this season they really uh, accept, sorry, no, I can't say the word, sorry. Uh, <laughs> they really like up, uh, focus a lot on the similarities in design and look from the magisterium to a lot of Nazi symbolism. Yeah, and I've... also in this picture, you can see it like there as well. Yeah, that, um, and so that... you know, just a little bit of content warning: we are going to talk about Nazism, yeah. uh, and we understand that these are obviously very, uh, very uh, sensitive but important issues to talk about. Um, yeah. So yeah, so you sent me this picture, which I thought was interesting, and we'll just compare the two. You've got, of course, the use of um, the well, the uh, misuse of Christianity, right, on the part of the Nazis. Um, and then it's kind of similarity to what we see from the magisterium. Yeah, exactly. So that uh, that Nazi symbolism was the symbol of the Luftwaffe, which was the air ship, air, uh, what's it called? 
yeah, uh, their air fighting force. Uh, and then if you look at the outfit that Cardinal MacPhail is wearing here, uh, that's very similar to what uh, sort of higher ups in SS uh, would wear so like the adjunct and officer if you look at those outfits uh, and yes this says Hugo Boss collection because Hugo Boss uh, designed their outfits um, which is interesting uh, kind of also go... like VW the car so, like the, the bug the car of the Nazi Wait, yeah yeah we just we're just gonna forget that apparently you keep buying cars um, yeah yeah definitely yeah. definitely <laughs> totally um but yeah I think that this uh in, this, in the first season, even though we're in Lyra's world, we are mostly seeing things from her perspective. And she's been a little sheltered more from the Magisterium than a lot of children because she is in the scholar uh, environment. But we do see that the scholars are not free to write about what they want to write about, uh, that the Magisterium controls them. So we, all, we see kind of Lyra as she grows up, and this is more than anything, Lo, you and I have talked about this a lot, a story about growing up and what does adulthood mean? What does childhood mean? Um, what does, you know, adolescence mean? Um, and she starts to realize that there are these powers that are controlling everything around her uh, and that things don't have to be exactly how the people, you know, at the Magisterium tell her. So Dust is the best example of that. The very end of season one, we get her, she's always been kind of a curious questioning child, but she got, you know, she and Pan have this conversation and Pan goes, why, you know, basically why should we believe the magisterium? The dust is bad. You know, maybe it's good. So we have her starting to question the magisterium. And I think in this season, when we get the, like these kind of large uh, meeting things, right. Where you get the, where the, basically the decisions are made if they're basically a there, there is a body, but it's basically an authoritarian society. Um, we start to see how uh, the magisterium is uh, going to take its colonialist endeavors beyond just one world. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They're going to the new world, which is obviously colonial language. And also they're trying to expand their reach in world. Uh, we see that a lot with witches, I think. Um, and it becomes very clear uh, when Martin Lancelius comes to the Magisterium and tells them about witch culture, uh, and the Magisterium definitely does not approve of this way of looking at the world. Uh, and then they decide that uh, to control the witches, they should just bomb them, bomb their sacred homelands and kill as many witches as possible. And that, uh, which I'm, as I mentioned in my essays, uh, I think is very, uh, relevant to our history because uh, the witches in Lyra's world live in the same country as the Sami people in our world does essentially uh, and Lake Inara, uh is a parallel to Inarayarvi in our world uh, which is an important location for Sami people the indigenous people of Sweden, Norway, Finland and Russia uh, yeah. and th that area was bombed during World War II by the Nazis. So, wow. Um, so you might that... wonder why they're talking about the Nazis. I mean, how can we not? No, no. Um, and, and I have this picture here too of the, the yeah. being their homeland burning. And this is also um, something you and I have talked about low and, and talked, I think, a little bit about perhaps in the colonialism video mm -hmm. is that it's about controlling them because they are different, but also um, they are kind of matriarchal. It is also the magisterium is very patriarchal and wants to control these women. And when you have that scene you were just mentioning, which I think is a brilliant scene, where you have a uh, representative who is human. So he's a man, therefore not a witch, right? It is it is only women who, who uh, if you're born, a, uh, you know, within that society and you're a woman, then you, you have the powers. If you're a man, you don't get the long life and the flight and that kind of such. So he, he is advocating for their way of life. Um, and they, what do they get on the witches for? Leaving their kids, for not being good mothers. This is automatically yeah. controlling women through what is believed to be our traditional role. Yeah, exactly. And you, they're also very skeptical of their free sexuality, which you obviously then see with them wanting to control Lyra because she's the Eve 2.0. Uh, and you can't have women just being free and having a sexuality. Um, so I think that's 
they want to control dust because they think dust is original sin. So they, and who's blamed for original sin? Oh, Eve. So all women. Yes. Uh, so we we have to control all women. Uh, yes. And that's very and similar. Yes, and that with Mary Malone, who is the quote unquote tempter, the serpent, which we get from the cave, this this uh, machine that she set up. Uh, but where does it come from? This is a plug for my upcoming essay, the I Ching, the Book of Changes, right? Uh, this kind of mystical fortune telling, very traditional um, Chinese practice. So dust actually can be spoken to in many ways. We have the Tartars who Japan themselves who let it in. We have the Chinese who use the I Ching, the Book of the Change, Book of Changes, um, and then we have the Lithiometer, which is the Western version of this. Um, but what's interesting about all that, while there is historically Japaning and there is the I Ching, the Book of Changes, the Lithiometer is certainly kind of a Pullmanism. Um, it's mm. kind of his answer to these kinds of things. But something I'm going to write about in my episode, or my um, uh, video and essay about Mary Malone and ta talking to Dust with the I Ching is that uh, it shows Pullman's attempt and in some ways his success of showing that um, it's a universal thing that multiple cultures can discover. And I think that to him is so so some of his fighting against the colonialist and orientalist thought that Westerners discover things and the Easterners mock or, or you know, mimic, right? Mm. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and... Uh, um... Sorry, that's way off topic of the witches. <laughs> no, that's fine. But, okay. This but... is why I told you I didn't want to do an episode by episode breakdown because I can't <laughs> keep... I'm not linear in my thinking. Uh... No, but I think that's very interesting But what, what you mentioned with Mary because then uh, you see that she's literally protected by angels uh, when she goes into Shitagatsi. She's protected by angels. The uh, specters are not coming after her. Yeah, so she's the serpent, which is evil according to Magisterium, but she's literally protected by angels. Uh, yeah, and you have the kids automatically liking her, you know, and yeah. it's kind of like they say like kids and dogs, you know, can kind of know when people are assholes, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, they kind of see her as a mother figure. Um, and But she, of course, unfortunately has to keep moving because she has a mission to save Lyra. Um, so we can definitely go back to the witches and all of this and the magisterium. But I, I, my favorite character is Mary. And so yeah. to see her, I literally jumped up from the couch. I was watching with a friend who were both very safe during COVID. We literally don't see anyone else. It's just, they're my hazard yeah. materials. Um, watch buddies hey Aaron I love you um and we I I literally was like wanted to jump up and I was like oh my god it's very alone I love it I love her so much not just because she's open an open-minded scientist who one who used this kind of eastern art um but I think what I love about her is what they did with the contrast between her and Marissa Coulter both learned women who are technically put in positions of power but look what Marissa Coulter sees what she's missing when she meets Mary and Lyra sees what she could be when she meets Mary as well. Yeah, and I think you mentioned how kids love Mary. And what I love about Mary is about that she's obviously caring and a good hearted person, but she's not a mother. She takes care of children, but she's not a mother. She can use, be a badass science lady who's an amazing aunt. Uh, but she she's not actually a mother, um, and but also like you say, she's an amazing contrast to Mrs. Coulter because Mrs. Coulter realizes what she could have been in a less patriarchal world. Obviously, our world is patriarchal too, but it's not on that level. <laughs> um, so contrasting them makes it so clear how important different feminist reforms have, have been. Uh, I talked about that a bit in my breakdown of that episode how things like women's equal access to education women's uh, ex equal access to the labor market uh, child care free child care uh, how like those kinds of reforms that the feminist movement have been fighting since yeah forever <laughs> uh, how they are so incredibly important for equality yeah. uh, and how you can't just you can't just say oh but now we have equal rights we have the right to wo vote for instance now everything is equal no obviously not we have to have structural change on several different levels we have to do 
education, labor, sexuality, uh, family rights, like it has to be multi leveraged. Uh, and that becomes so clear with Mrs. Coulter. Absolutely. And something we also both are interested in in our studies is the, um, the kind of uh, uh, uneven effects on specifically women of color as well. Obviously, we're seeing uh, white British ladies, um, which is one representation of how the patriarchy hurts women. But uh, we look at just the pay gap, for example. There are many examples, but I'll just take the pay gap women of color, like, like it just goes it's like white women, oh, like, you know, 75 cents to a, a man's dollar. And then it just goes down with each person, of, a woman of color. So, you know, um, we, you know, Lo and I obviously both recognize that this is one experience of uh, a woman in a patriarchal society and that actually women of color have even more working against them uh, systemically. And I think that becomes very clear with Mrs. Goldridge too, because it's not like she looks at the world and sees, oh, I'm being oppressed. Let me help lift up other women. No, she just, she steps on the shoulders of those, on, ba- on, on the backs of the people that she's pushing down to get to the top. I mean, she she gets uh, MacPhail elected as cardinal uh, to help her position. But she does that by suggest, suggest, suggesting that they bomb the witches' lands. Yes. Um, and in the last season, she was literally responsible for killing children, mainly marginalized children in different ways, based on marginalized on class and race and etc. Uh, so I think in many ways, she's. Uh, I've compared her before to a sort of white con- colonial lady who gets more power through oppressing others, uh, but she doesn't help anyone else up with her. And makes distinctions as well. Uh, One example, this is one of my favorite examples because I study um, early 20th century China specifically. Uh, White women in Western Europe and America were taking happy pills, basically opium pills, and then saying, oh, those, those lazy, uh, Chinese workers who smoke opium all day and don't do anything. Um, it's the same thing, but they make a distinction of, oh, because it's in a pill and a doctor gave it to me. You know, these kinds of little distinctions that I think a lot of white women make in a colonial society. Um, and, and I think that you also made me think, Lo, because you were talking about the children and using people to get to power. Um, she uses literally the specters, right? She controls them, but... What about Mr. Boreal over there? Wow, does he get used in this season? I mean, she leads him on, and I don't, it's hard to tell how much, same thing in the books, it's kind of hard to tell how much he believes her, Um, but he's uh, thinking with the wrong head in this season. Um, And she really uses him and uh, outsmarts him in a lot of ways. And it shows that, like the monkey, which I'm gonna talk about in my essay, right? It is, uh, it is very tricky, and it kind, it kind of can bring you joy and happiness, but then, you know, there's always kind of um, a trick to it, right? And so she works with works with Boreal, but she doesn't see him as an equal. And she actually banks on, you know, relies on him underestimating her, like everyone else has in her world, men specifically. <laughs> yeah, and it... Be, it- becomes increasingly obvious throughout the season how he underestimates all women. Uh, he is condescending to Mary when he meets her, and then he calls her arrogant when he talks to Marisa about her. And uh, the, yeah, essentially he has this idea that he's going to get Mrs. Coulter, and he's going to have his perfect trophy wife, and he's even bought her clothes uh, so he can dress her up and look all pretty. Yeah. Um, but he doesn't actually see her for who who she actually is. Yeah, and I think she really sees right through it. And uh, speaking of clothes, Lo, I love that you mentioned that because this is very explicit in the books and is a little more subtle in the show. Women don't wear pants in Lyra's world. So when Lyra gets to Chitagase and Mrs. Coulter gets to Will's world and they're given pants, they're like, What is this? What is happening? Um, So even the fashion itself shows the difference in the worlds. Um, And I and I find that really fascinating. And we also see, you know, with the witches as well, um, are also kind of wearing 
dress like, which, uh, by the way, the costuming in this season what, blew me away. Mm. I mean, they yeah. look amazing. Um, so I'm not getting, look, I'm wearing a dress right now. I like dresses. I'm not against them. But uh, it is interesting that the power dynamics um, of that are shown. You know, we have a historical photo from the 20s or 30s, I believe, of a woman walking down the street in pants and every man is looking at her and there's literally a dude in his car not looking at the road because he's looking back at her wearing pants. It was revolutionary when women stopped wearing skirts every single day. And um, for Lyra's role to not have taken that turn, uh, by showing that through Mrs. Coulter and through Lyra, I think is really fascinating. Yeah, and you can see that with like that scene when she's trying on clothes and she just holds up a pair of jeans like, <laughs> no. <laughs> and I mean, there's obviously also like class things there because she wants to look fancy. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I I really like what they've been doing with the clothes uh, this season. And uh, I thought we could maybe talk about Yo Paris clothing. Uh, and I'm thinking designed... for saying Joppery because I <laughs> am going to murder whoever decided that it's Joppery. And okay, minor, minor soapbox. Here it comes. Mm -hmm. Getting on it. What the heck? It's supposed to be like a pronunciation that's more like, well, in the books, more Eastern. And in, I think in the show, well, we can talk about this a little bit more in di Northern Indigenous. They would not say Joppery, okay? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a very minor thing. I could get over, I, I said Serafina Pekala, and then they said Serafina Pekala? Cool, I'm in. I am not in for Joppery. So it is Joe Pari, and this is a pro Joe Pari street <laughs> recording, yes. and we're going with that. It's Joe Pari, it is not Joppery. But yeah, let's tell, let's definitely. We need to also talk about the new characters. We've talked about Mary Malone, mm. talked a little, you know, Boreal. We get to know a lot more about him in this season, but we get, uh, you know, Joe Pari slash Stanislaus Grumman slash John Perry. Yes. And this little, this kind of bromance he's got going on with Lee. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Let's I mean, talk about his clothing because I noticed that as well, though. Yeah, I. I think that what I I think it's interesting, like you said, they made him less like Oriental Easterny with his clothing. He looks I mean he looks sort of like a guy I could run into at the village cafe up nor in northern Sweden where my family's from. Kinda looks uh, like a hipster in some ways. Yeah, I'm I mean they would the look right Yeah, like, they would like, they would think in New Mexico that dress like this. You know what I'm saying? Like with the like yeah, yeah. kind of south we would call it in America southwest style with like the tri with like the um kind of diamond kind of uh things. Yeah, I mean yeah, that too because I mean he would be like you're a bit fancy. What are you doing? But he would fit in in a in the village cafe as well. Yeah. Uh, he's not like in the books, he's is described much more like a shaman uh, and more like Easterny, uh, I would say. Uh, and you and I have talked about this before, but uh, in the books, the village where he lives, the people basically worship him. Uh, and they have totally cut that out, uh, which I think was a good move on them. <laughs> yeah, Pullman... I, I give him some passes, but in, as you'll find out in my essay and in our video that we did, once again, link in the description about Orientalism and colonialism in, this, in the book series, um, dude, <laughs> like every, like Philip, every Orientalist trope is in there. I literally have a checklist and all of them are checked, <laughs> you know? So just don't make me Philip. But I think they did correct a lot of things this, uh, in this adaptation. Um, but, Lo, I was wondering what you thought about kind of like you were saying, it is it is less Eastern. Um, it felt to me more in, indigenous. I don't know, like it, it, kind of an amalgam of what of many different indigenous tropes. Yeah, uh, definitely. But I think it uh, you could definitely see him more as like northern indigenous shaman uh but it's not like they they haven't like done oh we're just gonna give him a jacket from this group's culture um which i think it was good it's more like he talks about in some 
in one of the episodes about he, how he's met uh, scholars, he's met, met witches, he's met shamans, and then he's like taken a little, little bit from everything. Um, and I think uh, them presenting it like that works a lot better than him being like initiated into one group and learning all the things from them. Yeah, and he specifically in the books learns from a certain tribe of the Tartars. So it would be like, um, you know, if uh, it would be like rather than being having Native American imagery or specifically Cherokee imagery or Apache imagery, you know what I'm saying? But instead, he they definitely zoomed out a little bit on his representation. And I think they also, except for the scene with where he calls up wind, they do also downplay the mysticism a little bit, which I do appreciate um, because uh, like I kind of talked about in our video about Orientalism, um, you know, growing up in such a culture and understanding the significance of the mysticism of that culture is very different from coming in and learning it. Um, you know, I speak Mandarin Chinese. Uh, I learn all, all about China that I can, but I will never fully appreciate um, the like the heart and soul of a lot of the teachings um, from uh, from East Asia, and I recognize that. Uh, and I think that uh, this Jokari was uh, a little bit more humble than the one in the books. Yeah, there's a moment when he he talks about how he's seen folly and wisdom everywhere, and Lee asks him if what they're doing is wisdom or not, and he's. He just says, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just doing my best. Yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe we can talk a little bit about me. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I just can't. It's so hard. Um, it's really hard to talk about this. This is the part uh, that I dreaded the most, um, honestly, because, yeah. you know, we knew it was coming. That doesn't mean we accept it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um i so i had that picture of them together and uh here is a picture by himself um and i had to, i literally had to pick the solo picture of him i had to pick that i found a really great one with him with the rifle and i was like yeah. i can't do it i cannot put that up on the screen <laughs> so this is when he's confronting um the guy who ends up being kind of reporting him to the magisterium uh, yeah. and is the first time and that's that is a sweet sweet scene because Hester is like he shot first Lee like Lee is distraught because he he's, yeah. he is kind of a gunslinger you know uh his his story especially that that one short story that Pullman wrote I believe it's Once Upon a Time in the North is mm -hmm. really like a western story and he's like kind of the wild wild west kind of um feel but he's not out there to just kill people he is only a defensive fighter um and this really shows the beginnings of his willingness to use violence for the right reason and something that we see his development throughout the books and in the show at first he's just an aeronaut he just wants to get paid but by the end he is fighting for a just cause he is a helping lyra i'm sorry I so bad. I know. It's so hard. I'm. I'm sorry. I don't mean to cry on camera, but like when Hester said that line from the books, "We're a helping yeah. Lyra." I. I'm glad I was alone. Aaron was not with me because I bawled my eyes out. I had to pause and just cry. Oh yeah. my god. Uh, yeah. Oh god. Uh, <laughs> so hard. Um. I was gonna say. <laughs> I was going to say, um, in that episode that you showed the screenshot from, um, I think we see a ve another very clear uh, part of Lee's character is that he's he's been through a lot. He's had a traumatic upbringing, but he's decided to try to do the best he can in life and be good to other people. Mrs. Yeah. Coulter, on the other hand, went the complete other, other side and was like, I've been without power, I've been hurt, I've been traumatized. I'm going to do everything in my power to get as much power as possible, no matter the con consequences. Yeah. And Lee is like, no, I won't do whatever. Uh, my life is not worth other people's lives. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to protect Lyra and I'm going to do the best by everything that I can. Absolutely. 
absolutely. And we have also, um, he is a free spirit. We do see that with, uh, you know, with the being an aeronaut. And what I love about um, Hester, other than Stelmaria, because she's a queen, Hester is yeah. my favorite demon um, because she is, oh, is comfortingly, she also kind of help, helps him not be so impulsive. She kind of questions a couple of decisions and is like, should we really be doing this? And Hester is, that's what's really great about their relationship is that um, kind of like, like with Pan and Lyra, they negotiate, they figure things out together. Uh, but it's a little bit more of a witty banter between uh, Lee Scoresby and Hester. Um, so uh, I, I don't know where to go there with Lee because I don't want to go just straight ahead to his demise because he had so much going on for him this season. Because not only did he have that scene, you know, where he um, was, you know, uh, he's been constantly trying to find Lyra, but he literally goes into another world for her. He is literally... Yeah. Um, attacked by the magisterium they follow him and they go after him in a nazi like fashion uh yeah. with orders to do whatever it takes it's really only lyra that they're after everyone else is collateral damage and he goes you know he goes with um the intention of doing whatever it takes to help lyra um and yeah. that's i think to me just the most touching kind of, of all the characters, um, you know, obviously I thought Mary Malone had a lot going on, witches have a lot going on, but this season goes to Lee as far as um, important storylines that make, that will impact the audience uh, throughout the whole series. Yeah, and I think what's so clear, for instance, when you compare him to Yopari, that is that Lee is just, I'm going to help this girl this little child that I love and no one else actually cares about her in a healthy way and I'm gonna help her while Yopari and Asriel and everyone else is focused on the big picture and is willing to give up on the children uh, on the on the way uh, so I mean uh, to sort of quote A Song of Ice and Fire he was gonna he he had to save the children, no matter what. Exactly. Uh, I butchered that quote because I didn't remember it, but it's something like that. Yeah, no, um, and that's something that Pullman and Martin have in common, actually, is their advocacy for children within their uh, their series, and which, you know, um, is appreciated, uh, especially in fantasy, um, because, uh, you know, oftentimes children are the protagonists. Uh, yeah. And a lot of bad things happen to them. Um, and so to have this story in particular, I think, touches me uh, emotionally is that you have and, you know, we can maybe move on to talk about, Will, you know, the, the big two, the dynamic duo, Will and Lyra. Um, you have these two kids uh, that are about to, re you know, to reach um, puberty, basically. One, you know, Will a little bit sooner than Lyra. Um, but they're just trying to figure things out. They're fr literally from different worlds and they uh, have to come together for a, a mission bigger than themselves. And, uh, you know, most people their age are not ready for the kinds of things that they have to deal with. Uh, and you see that also in Tsukaze with the children that have been left behind. Um, at first they're like, yeah, no parents, no adults, we can do what we want. And then they quickly turn rabid and lonely right? They, they need um, direction. And they also need comfort. And, you know, Will and Lyra have to go on this mission without that. Lyra didn't have a mom. Uh, she had an uncle who turned out to be your dad, like, but he was kind of, he just kind of come and show her cool stuff that he got them as travels and then leave. She was raised by scholars. So like not, you know, the most direct upbringing. Will was a parentified child, adultified child. He had to take care of his mom and his dad wasn't there. So we have these two children who have had very um, difficult childhoods. But what I found interesting, and they did it really well in the show and um, it's, you know, from the books, uh, is that Will is a very serious child and Lyra is a little bit more free spirited and they kind of balance each other out. They're kind of, he's kind of the yang to her yin. Uh, it's kind of interesting the way that they adapted that. Yeah, definitely. I and you can see that with 
like the the difference is we talked about earlier how Lyra was a bit sheltered growing up, and Will was the opposite of that. He had to be a child carer. He had to take care of his mom and also make sure that the forties uh, in his world didn't figure out that he was doing that. Um, and also, he's a young black man in a racial uh, in a racist society. Uh, and I think you could definitely tell that when they were in his Oxford, uh, for instance, when he was looking after his grandparents and the grandparents called the police on him uh, and he was just frazzled and panicked. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, they didn't explicitly say that, but I can imagine being a, a black boy, uh, but seen as a young black man by society, you would be even more uh, worried Terrified. about the police. Absolutely. Uh, and in the books, you know, Will is constantly, we can't go to the authorities, we can't go to the authorities. Mm-hmm. But in this adaptation, that I what I really appreciate is that that's even more heightened because of the way that our society functions, especially when it comes to police brutality. So you really have him already at that age and probably many years earlier, very young age, people of color become aware of this, mm-hmm. of, uh, not not being able to trust the authorities to not kill you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and yeah, Lyra realized that in season one that uh, this the authorities aren't on your side because the authorities in her world are extremely corrupt. Uh, and but she still doesn't have that deep seated like awareness is in her body in how she moves through society that she has to be careful Uh, and will has that for a lot of different reasons he knows that he has to be aware constantly of everything around him yeah and you do have them um and oh my god red pandas and pan is a red panda and you have will um getting to know pan they had really great scenes together uh, you know, he almost touched Pan once and then realized that's a taboo in Lyra's world. And then there's that one scene where Pan, you know, kind of boops, <laughs> basically boops uh, Will to comfort him. And then he tells Lyra, it's okay, I wanted to do it, right? So you have this really intimacy that, that is going on. And oh my God, I'm sorry, he's just so cute. <laughs> I just I can't know. get over the design of Pan this season because you do have him as... Um, uh, is that an ermite? I can never. Yeah, it's that. an ermine. Yeah. Yeah, you have that, and you're like, okay, that's like a little mousy thing. That's kind of cute. Um, but then they saw you, little cute mousy thing, and then they raised you a red panda. I mean, yeah. come on, like, ugh, it is so cute. And I'm sorry, like that's literally my only commentary is that he's so freaking cute because uh, I know. And, and it really kind of shows too. That Lyra, because, you know, he's an extension of her, Lyra is starting to become more, even though it's a foreign place, she's becoming more comfortable with Will. Um, yeah. And, you know, so Pan is starting to show some affection toward Will, and that's an extension of Lyra warming up to him. Um, we see this, obviously, in the last episode of season one, where, um, you know, Coulter and Azriel are making out, and then uh, Stelmaria and her monkey are like, hmm, oh, yay, they're kind of getting, like, a little yeah. bit intimate. Uh, you know, so so you there it is an extension of the person, and so you do show through Pan, Red Pan, duh, um, that uh, they're starting to to really have affection toward each other, and you know they're still very young. So what does that mean is also a huge question for them. Yeah, yeah, and I just <sighs> he's so cute. I I know I read somewhere I can't remember who said this, but. Uh, one thing you can see with him being a red panda is he's like big and fluffy but also sort of not clumsy but he seems a bit clumsy and awkward which is a very teenage thing yeah. <laughs> as well. I can see that. Yeah, because like red pandas their um their proportions are a little strange. You know, their yeah. heads a little big for their body, their tail is very bushy. Um so it is also her kind of like I mean look you know, see how the big the paws are, the ears are big, yeah. the tail is is quite wide. Um, you do see kind of uh, Pan starting to uh, reflect that kind of awkward adolescence um, going on. Um, yeah. So, but they're 
in Chitagaze for a reason, and that is the knife. Um, so yeah. what do we think about the design, the storytelling behind it? Um, what, what do we think about the knife, Lo? Uh, I mean, it looks amazing. Uh, I have a lot of things about the backstory that I want to talk about. So I don't know if we should start with that or just if you have more thoughts on the design that you want to share. Uh, I think the one thing I wanted to say about the design is that the hilt looks amazing, first of all. Um, I pictured it slightly longer, but once again, I'm not a purist. What I did, I think the best part of it, I'm, I'm sorry if you can hear the sirens. Uh, I'm in a city, so that's what happens. Um, but I think the way that it twisted and you could see the one side that cuts through at windows to worlds and the other side that basically kills everything. Um, if you're a supernatural fan, it's like the gun that can kill God basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so the way that they integrated that into the design, I think worked really beautifully. And when I first saw it, I was just like, oh my God, it's the knife, I got excited. Um, but then the next time I saw it, I really looked at the details and I could tell that they um, put a lot of thought into it. And that's really all fans ask for is that you put thought into these kinds of things. Um, because yeah. there are some shows, especially later seasons, where you <laughs> stop putting that much thought into it and it shows. I'll leave yeah, that there. Like, like <laughs> Chloe on Girls Gone Canon it says, it's nice that things mean things. Yeah, it's nice when things mean things. <laughs> all right. <laughs> All I'm saying, but yeah, yeah, and so the the design itself, you've got the the angel symbol uh, on the hilt, which looks a lot like uh, the statue outside of the Tour de Angeli, the uh, Tower of Angels. Um, you you have a lot going on. You also have um, so let's maybe we can talk a little bit about some symbolism that goes around it. Sacrifice, right? The bearer mm -hmm. is marked by being, you know, cut. So he has his you know two fingers shortened. Um, yeah. because of this and when he talks to i believe it's giacomo correct is that the, the uh yeah bearer? giacomo Par parditi yeah giacomo parditi who if we're talking about just characters that had a little really short storyline but killed it it was this guy i mean he did an amazing job explaining to will what the knife is for the responsibilities behind it the sacrifice that comes with it um and he also you can tell is really scared for this kid because he realizes how young he is and how big of a deal this is. And of course that final scene with him and the specters was mm. wow, really, really well done. I felt a lot of emotion coming from that actor. I think he really embodied that very important, but very minor character. Yeah, definitely. I used, yeah. Uh, him telling the story uh, and the rules and like everything. And then yeah, going out on his own, own terms just amazing um one thing i wanted to say about the knife design is that the blade and i i didn't catch this this is straight from girls gone canon but uh then the blade of the knife mirrors the top part of the tower yes uh, as well that is a great point you notice here it twists yeah. right just it's... like the knife the the tour de angeli the top of it the steeple if you will um twists right yeah. Um, wow, that was a great catch by uh, Chloe and Eliana there. Please check out Girls Gone Canon. In case you haven't noticed, we're both fans and patrons as well. Um, yeah. And they deserve your support, uh, both listener-wise and monetarily. Um, so plug for Girls Gone Canon. Uh, they do yeah. historic materials and a song of ice and fire. So yes. check them out. And I was on uh, their episode for episode one of the season of historic materials as well. Yes, so check that out. Lo killed it and also gave me some shout outs, uh, which was very much appreciated because <laughs> we had just talked about, um, uh, we had just done our, our yeah. video on colonialism and orientalism. So that was wonderful. Um, but <laughs> yeah, it mirrors kind of um, the tower and it mirrors... It, and it, you can kind of think of it as kind of an angelic design then, you know, it's, it's kind of a representation of uh, how uh, the, the angels have um, designed things, right? It's a true, the, the tower is a tribute to them and the knife is also kind of a tribute to this angelic power as well. Um, so we have the rules, right? You know, uh, always close the window once you're gone through. Um, uh, oh, what, what were the other rules? No, I'm bad at this. Don't use it for base purposes. Yes. Um, don't give it to someone else. Yeah, duh. <laughs> uh, don't give it to someone else. It should be obvious. Yeah. I uh, don't remember the other ones, but they're, <laughs> those are the important ones, I think. 
and it does actually uh, remind me a little bit of, because uh, over at John Lobster Film, we just did three weeks of Lord of the Rings coverage. It does remind me a little bit of The Ring. Everyone wants it, but it's a huge responsibility and it has some corrupting influences. We see that with Tony, who has mm -hmm. it and in the tower uh, and Will has to fight to get it away from him. Uh, it has shown that it's it needs a special person to to bear it, right? The ring bearer, the knife bearer. I think there's a lot of similar symbolism going on there of um, an object that can corrupt. Um, and it's a little different from the lithiometer, which was created in Liva's world, but doesn't have the same kind of magical aspects to it and mystical and, and angelic, if you will, uh, celestial energy that is coming from the knife. But I will say, I love that Philip Pullman is like, and you get a magical object, and you get a magical <laughs> object. Like both my protagonists get magical objects. <laughs> like they both get something that is that they can that only they can use that is special and important to the plot and important to the mission of, yeah. of the main protagonist. And so, I mean, I just think that more than anything about this series is it has set up and payoff. Everything is there for a reason, and it doesn't. It doesn't just have random things that um, are unnecessary, right? Like the subtle knife is important. The second one is called the subtle knife, right? The first one um, is called the Northern Lights in uh, in the UK version, but actually in the American version, it's called the Golden Compass, which is named after the alethiometer. So in a way, if you take that as the Golden Compass, the subtle knife, and then the amber spyglass, all of them are named after these objects. Um, so everything comes full circle with Pullman, and I think that he is a very good strategic writer, and he plots, not like, heh, heh, heh. I mean, like, puts mm -hmm. together plots. He plots things very deliberately, and I think we see that really come together in this second season. Yeah, definitely, and just uh, when you said that part about the, ni uh, the knife being like the ring from Lord of the Rings, I recently the other day watched the movies um and one thing that they yeah obviously talk about in those stories uh is how every everyone is after the ring and the power that it will give you uh for good or ill um yeah. people wanted to save the world people wanted to control the world whatever um but it gives that it's it's the ring of power uh and that's the case with the knife as well. It gives you a huge amount of power to whoever wields it and whoever controls it. Um, and that's that's become so clear in that world, in that society, that the only some people have power. They have power to protect themselves against specters. They have con power to go into other worlds and get resources. But only a few limited people have that power. Yeah. Uh, and... I, I wrote about that a lot uh, this season, and one, uh, to get a bit more theoretical, um, one... Um, you know, never. <laughs> no, I would never quote things and reference things. Um, yeah, one thing that, uh, one uh, theory or concept that I used uh, is something that's called the bio-necropolitical collaboration. Uh, which Simple, is a short. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a term coined by... Uh, the researcher Jasper, uh, Jasper Poir, um, and she described, it's a fancy word, but basically it means that uh, different patterns of inclusion and exclusion in society produces different lives and death for different peoples and groups. So uh, if, you, uh, if you have a lot of resources, then you can get a long life. And if you have few re resources, you get a short life, basically. Yeah. Uh, and society is structured to give to prior prioritize different people, um, and she describes that as uh, different bodies getting different prognosis times, and I think that becomes extremely clear in uh, in Shitagasi because yeah. the people who have the knife and have the resources, they have a much longer prognosis time uh, than the people who don't have the knife because they will get spectered eventually and then um, they will be alive but there's their life will not be a life that is valued by society absolutely and and Pullman plays a lot with the ideas of life and death and necropolitics um, and something that we see that is similar to uh, Martin is 
uh, George R. R. Martin, who writes a song by some fire, in case you're unaware, people, um, is that uh, he has a lot of undead, people that are technically alive but lost their soul, and Pullman has the exact same thing with the specters. So both of these authors, um, and a lot of fantasy authors, actually, um, are interested in that. You have the, um, the uh, oh my god, the Nazgul in uh, Lord of the Rings, they're, they are kind of alive, but kind of dead, and they're controlled by their 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 uh, desire for the ring. Um, you have the, oh god, gonna need your help with this, the guards of the prisoner of, of, of the er, in Azkaban. The what? The Dementors. The Dementors, right? So you have that in Harry Potter. Um, I really have a hard time thinking of a single fantasy series that doesn't play with the questions of life and death. And this is um, a huge part. The specters are a huge part of what Philip Pullman is trying to do. And the soul, the idea of the soul with the demons is a huge part of questioning what makes us human uh, and life and death, right? Your demon disappears when you die. Uh, and the third book and the third season, a little, a little plug for those of you that should keep watching because it gets better. Um, the question of where does our soul go is also mm. is heavily discussed in the third book uh, and addressed in the third book and will be uh, obviously addressed in season three. Um, but yeah, so so you have, uh, you know, with these specters, you have someone like Giacomo who was protected by the ninth. Um, and he, like you were saying, Glow, well, then has the resources. But you see in, um, and they didn't show it, uh, in season two, I know we got an episode cut because of the coronavirus, um, but you didn't see what we have in the book, which is you literally see a human, who, uh, a parent who has their kid on their back, get attacked by a specter and the kid is crying and is totally okay, but then their parent just stops and is just not there anymore. And that, I I get why they didn't show that. They, they kind of tried to show that with the guy who was getting water and just was letting it overflow, the like vacancy. But what I really liked about that scene in the book is it shows the switch and the second you don't have your soul, which is, um, you know, I think they pretty much make it clear in the in the show and it's even more clear in the books. They're basically eating your soul like they take your soul yeah. and you're just there. And so it's as if they don't have their demons anymore. They're basically taking your demon. Um, and so like with. Go just going back to talk about uh, Joe Pari for a second, uh, Will, uh, Will Perry's dad. Um, he discovers his demon, right? This bird who has always been with him. Um, and I will just say though, they did not change the name of the demon, which was Orientalist. Uh, but you know, like it wasn't like John or, or like Jerry or something. It was like a, a really Asian sounding name, but that's a small thing. Um, he has that line that uh, I really like, um, that is interesting when we're talking about gender. And we're definitely gonna talk about this in February on Bleep the Patriarchy that like, come on with the binary people, can we get over it? But I did like that line where he said, I didn't know, I discovered a part of me that was female. And I, mm. I did appreciate that line, even though it is a little old fashioned, um, this kind of idea of finding your feminine side as a man. But I mean, he is an old dude. <laughs> I'm an older guy from England, you know, even though he's an adventurer, you kind of get the sense he's a little bit more traditional in some ways, even though he is open minded. Um, so this Liger's world really opened his ideas to the possibilities um, about things like gender uh, and that you can't, you know, you're necessarily one or the other. Um, and so I think that while well, I'm going all over the place, because I was just talking about death and now I go way back to gender. Um, but this idea of, you know, um, he is alive and who he is because of his demon, because of his soul, and the specters take that from you. And you are alive, but not alive. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think that someday I'm going to have to write an essay about the gender and demons. Uh, I'm probably going to touch on that in the essay I talked about, about traveling through unsafe spaces. Um, not i'm trying to figure out what i can say without being too spoilery of the books of dust um but yeah uh yen i think it's interesting uh that uh they have this idea of completeness uh with having a feminine side and a masculine side uh to someone um and yeah what happens if you don't have that? That exactly. would be interesting. Exactly, and this is something that I am going to talk about um, in respect to, I'm going to basically, for every single series, just go ahead and write a yin and yang essay on it. I'm going to do it with The Witcher. 
Um, and I'm going to do it with the Song of Ice and Fire. I'm just going to go ahead and do it with uh, His Dark Materials, too, because there is this idea of dualism, and we're definitely going to talk about this in February. Please be prepared, because we're going to talk about the binary, <laughs> and I'm going to talk about humanity's obsession with dualism. Like, you you know, there are, mu- there are two things, and they are balanced together. And this is, yeah. I think, Philip Pullman's expression of that, you know? Um and you do have the yin and yang symbol, which literally is black and white, and then each has a dot of each. Um, but like I'm going to say then, and like I'll say now, it is hierarchical. The yang, the male, the, the light, the sun, is above the female. The dark, uh, the moon versus the sun, right? So you do have this hierarchical thing going on. But what I do appreciate about what Philip Pullman is doing here is that it is the person and the soul, and they seem to be equal. And when what Coulter then does is perverts that by kind of severing herself from them, right? But you yeah. don't see that. You see the way that Will and Hester care for each other and the way that Pan and Lyra care for each other. That's natural. That's what Philip Pullman is telling us is good. And then what uh, Mrs. Coulter is doing with her demon is unnatural. Yeah, definitely. And I think... Um that's obviously a sign of her mental state and how, I mean, it's a form of self-harm when she beats her demon um, because she literally beats herself uh, and hurts herself. And yeah, I think that's just another way of her trying to be in control and have power even over herself because she has not been able to have power in all instances of her life for different reasons. Yeah, it's her way of trying to gain what little bit of control she can. Um, but in the end, it's it's not good for her. And we do see when she, it's basically hinted at, um, you know, show watchers, I, I'm sorry if this is, feels like a spoiler because it's really not. But the reason that she can control the specters is because she is not connected to her demon like she should be. Yeah. She has done something, we don't know what, um, watching the show that has made her able we see in season one she can be further away from her demon like the witches but she's not a witch that should be like that should have made your alarm bells go off immediately as a show watcher like why is that monkey so far away and then she's she's the only one that we see hit um she doesn't talk to her demon we never hear that monkey talk ever she doesn't call it by a name it doesn't have a name so you have this kind of um you know, the reason that, like, in this picture, you see the specter not touching her, and then she eventually is able to get them to do her bidding is because they can't feed off of her. Um, because she is not, I don't want to use the word pure, but that's kind of what it is. She has tainted herself in her relationship with her demon because her relationship with herself is so toxic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and... Yeah, like we sort of mentioned before, uh, a contrast with that is obviously Lee, who has, according to the show at least, had similar childhood traumas she has, but he's very close with his demon. And that's not to say that whatever she's done has is like her failing or something, just that people respond to trauma very differently. Um, and... Um, uh, I know I talked to our friend Rohan uh, Cyril Woodcock on Twitter about this um, because I, because she knows a lot about psychology and trauma, um, and I was like, "Is it normal uh, for women with trauma to uh, sort of internalize misogyny and take it out on other women and try to get power?" And she's like, "Yep, yep, yep." Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and please do check out the video I did with Rohan about Cersei. We talk a lot about some internalized misogyny um, and how it affects women. Um, but, I, you know, I would love to talk to her about that, but I don't even have to because of one of my grandmas was exactly like that. Um, you know, not to get too personal, but there are five grandchildren, four gra- granddaughters like me, one grandson. Guess which one's the favorite, even though he's the most screw up of all of us. And guess who always gets a pass? got a pass my, my grandma passed away which is why i can talk about it um but you know this this uh favoring of men over women thinking that and this idea of um something rohan and i love to talk about is this idea of 
I'm, I'm not like other women. I'm a one in a thousand. And this idea that like, oh, I'm a special woman compared to these mediocre women. But every man gets to be special. That's not, no. <laughs> that yeah. is internalized misogyny. Thinking that you can rise above your womanly ways, um, whereas men naturally are special. Mm. And Mrs. Yeah. Coulter definitely, she look, look, look around in the room with the magisterium. She's the only woman there. She feels like, you know, I, I do think there was one scene where they kind of had basically nuns there, but other, but she is the only like, like non-religious, not in the church figure, basically. Um, by being a part of the magisterium, she is technically in the church because there is no separation of church and state in Lyra's world when it comes to the magisterium. But she is technically a the only female political figure in that room. So of course she would have this internalized misogynistic view that she is special, she is different. And that is really shown in season two, um, like I said, especially when it comes to Boreal, because she yeah. sees it as she is going to do whatever she can to get ahead. And she uses, um, and quite frankly, he's not a good guy. So it's not like I'm make, you know, being like, oh, poor yeah. Boreal. But um, she does use his own um, misogyny against him. And, but it helps to, unfortunately, it also reinforces her own internalized misogyny at the same time. Yeah, and like like we mentioned before, she she uh, suggests bombing the witches. Uh, she literally approves killing children last season, um, and I think a very telling moment in this season is when they're in Shitagatsi and she sees uh, the person who has been spectered and it starts examining them and says, "We could learn from this." Yeah. Uh, she also tortures one of the witches who yeah. once call, literally calls out for death, calls out for Yambayaka. Um, yeah. I also found it interesting that they did not have Serafina be the one to kill her. It was uh, Rudy, Ruta Scotti. Yeah. Am I correct in that? Yeah, Ruta Scotti, yeah. Yeah, so in the books, uh, whenever that witch cries out for Yambayaka, they're their um, kind of deity of death. Um, uh, Serafina hears the call in the books um, and is actually kind of invisible hanging about. But here they had Ruta Scotti hearing it and then like being way up in the air and then boom, flying down. Um, and yeah. I kind of get why they did a little less on the archery, but God darn, I just love in the books where they're just shooting arrows and everything. Um, they, they definitely like put that on the DL in, in this series. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but they, I mean, they expanded Ruta's role a lot in a lot of good ways uh, in the books. Yes. She's a lot more focused on... Um, uh, on supporting Asriel because she's had an affair with him, essentially. Yeah, uh, which is not great. So here we, in the middle we have uh, Serafina, and then I believe to the right is Ruta Scotti, correct? Yeah, and then to the left is Reina something. So they uh, are they are like they are witches who who are leaders in their community. They rule certain parts yeah. of the witch lands. Yeah, that's my understanding story. of it. Yeah, um, I think. I think Reina's made up. Uh, the other witch that joins them in Shiragatsi that gets uh, tortured by culture and reveals the big secret, uh, Lena Felt, she's in the books as well. Um, and I only know that because I once did a list of like Scandinavian sounding names um, because I'm from Sweden, for those who don't know. Um, and uh, yeah, Lena Felt sounds extremely Swedish to me. Uh, and also can be translated as smooth fields. Hot. <laughs> Very hot. Very interesting. Oh, that's okay. I love that. And, you know, um, uh, Lowe did a really great breakdown of some linguistic things, naming things going on in our uh, Orientalism and Colonialism uh, video. So, I mean, this is like the seventh time, but please check that out because uh, they did a really good job of kind of looking at how deliberate Philip Pullman is when he names things. He's obviously naming things for specific reasons. Um, and I also did want to say something that without knowing, uh, you know, uh, these kinds of northern names that we can think of is Mary. What does that make you think of? Um, it yeah. can make you think of what I like is the dualism. It can make you think of Mary, Mother of God, but it can also make you think of uh, Mary Magdalene, who has yeah. been vilified. <laughs> <laughs> called a sex worker when she may not have been and even if she was what do you care anyway i'm sorry yeah uh, that's for another day but what i'm saying is that she's given a name that can either be a temptress or um a kind of virginal kind of 
representation. So then to make her the tempter, right? By giving her that name, it lets you know, maybe like with dust being original sin, it's actually not what we think it is, not what the magisterium yeah. thinks that it is. Exactly. Yeah, that that's very interesting. Uh, definitely. Um, um, yeah, but we've been going all over the place slow. Uh, what do you want to cover now? Oh, um... You can go back to any of the topics we've already talked about or talk about something new that we haven't Should we mentioned. talk a bit about Asriel? Um, you mean, mister, I'm creating an army, dude? <laughs> yeah. And oh, yes. yes. It is yes, about to go down with Asriel. Yes, the first thing I want to say is... Astral, stop it with a man-made climate change. <laughs> Can you not, like, single-handedly, like, bring down <laughs> nature? Yeah, he's a, he's a great comic. He's, like, seriously, he's basically all of... I don't know if you've seen Fern Gully Low. No. But it's like Avatar, the one with the blue people, not the good one with the last airbender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Where it's like, you should save the planet, kind of like... But it's with fairies. I think you'd like Fern Gully. Um, is a very early, I was even in the 90s, it's a very early uh, anti-climate change messaging. Um, and Azrael's all of like Fern Gully and Avatar in one. It's like, dude, you're like, stop it. Um, so what the, and I think the interesting thing about Azrael Lowe is that we only see him in the last scene and yet his presence is felt throughout this whole season because we know he's up to something. Yeah, and I mean, that's, that's a very interesting theme that gets brought up throughout the season too. It's like, uh, what is the does the end justify the means basically, yeah. uh, and does uh, with uh, Joe Parry says that at some point like who likes Asriel? No one likes Asriel, but he's doing a good thing, uh, and yeah, seems like he's doing a good thing being anti the magisterium and trying to advocate for uh, freedom of knowledge and uh, etc. Um, but also we know that he was okay with killing Roger last season. We know he hasn't been there for Lyra. Um, and we see one clear, one very clear uh, consequence of his actions which is yeah, his man-made climate change, uh, Astral made climate change. Um, and I think it's very significant that we see that the Panzerbjorn are the ones being uh, hit the hardest by it. Because yeah. uh, as I've argued before, uh, you can see them as a sort of parallel to indigenous people of the Arctic um, who are currently being hit uh, very hard by climate change uh, in our world. And if you want to read at just surface level, how many pictures have you seen of polar bears stuck on ice in the middle and just kind yeah, of yeah and they're starving too um yeah uh so you know you can look at it of course on the surface level of nature and the animal kingdom and how we're harming them but then like you said Lo, if we look a little bit closer and we dig deeper we also see what we're doing to the indigenous peoples of the world who um are extremely valuable and and many of them as well like the native um peoples of America, what is now America, um, a lot of times their culture is focused on being stewards of the land. And then we have, um, you know, this kind of white colonial aspect um, that comes in and is about sucking out resources in as if they were inexhaustible, which we know is not true. There's only so much water. There are only so many mountains that have not been mined. There's only so much mm. ice in the Arctic and it's getting less and less. Um, so yeah, the, and the Panzerbjorn, and like Asriel, aren't very much in this season and yet are ever present because of how they're being affected by what we're seeing, by the main events. Yeah, yeah and just uh, to add a Scandinavian perspective, um, I mentioned the Sami people before and they are all, uh, very much being affected by climate change. Um, a lot of Sami people, not all, but a lot, uh, have traditionally been re reindeer herders uh, and reindeers need a lot of uh, different areas to graze. They have like places they are in the winter times and places they are in the summer times and a lot of that uh, area is being uh, yeah, ruined or 
doesn't work anymore uh, for them to live on because of climate change. Um, and also, like you mentioned, with people uh, taking care of land, uh, Sami people uh, often are in the forefront of climate change activism here because they know they they have uh, lived on this land for a long time and know how to do so sustainably while other people try to mine it or put on big wind farms which are obviously good but not when they also destroy the eco- ecosystems where they are being put up yeah definitely and, and the american equivalent of that would be the uh, fight against the pipeline in north dakota which is uh, being spearheaded by uh, native peoples here um so yeah. yeah we have a lot of climate change going on uh you know climate uh uh, pro-climate, you know, arguments in this, uh, that that little bit that we get kind of, you know, we see it with the Panther Bjorn, like you're saying, the armored bears, which are the best part of the series, uh, other than the demons, of course. Um, and then we also do see, you know, Asriel focusing on building his army, and I believe that they, they, they do give in this season, Lo, you can correct me if I'm wrong, they do actually mention the Republic of Heaven, do they not? Yeah, uh, he wants a Republic of Heaven above and a Republic of Ideas below. Yeah, so he is talking, so you have literally, um, by saying that, it's literally Asriel arguing for the separation of church and state, kind of. Uh, But he is also perverting it. And I think that's really what Pullman is trying to do with Asriel, which is to show that you can say that you're rational and you're for science and you're for so-called progress and all of this but then with that also comes exploitation it also comes just dis- destruction of resources and with it also comes being a bad dad <laughs> okay like it's a small thing but dude like seriously your daughter just figured out that you're you know that you're her dad this whole time and they never even really get to sit down and have a real conversation about that we get a little bit of that in season one but what i found really interesting low going back to mrs coulter which also is kind of connected with asriel is you have that last scene in the end of season one where it looks like she's kind of for lack of a better term had a coming to jesus moment she's kind of realized i want lyra i want to be a good mom and then automatically unlearns it like literally the second that the second book begins and that this uh season starts right she's back to her power hungry games and i think in that, in some ways, and Asriel kind of calls her on that in the first season. He says, you want the power. Don't act like you're, you you know, don't want it. So in some ways, Asriel is a more honest version of Mrs. Coulter's power. Yeah, and I mean, I suppose he can be more honest because he can, it's more acceptable for him as a man to go searching for power. Um, yeah. I think that's uh, this is sort of on to- off topic, but I once uh, wrote an essay about the reluctant hero trope um, and how that's very prevalent in a lot of series, like uh, in A Song-, Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones. I don't want it! I'm sorry, I have to do <laughs> exactly. it. <laughs> exactly. That was sorry, the- I just ex- had to do it. Like, I'm sorry, I just have to say this right now. D&D themes are not just for 7th grade. <laughs> book reports, or you said book reports, whatever they said, Themes are important, and if you half ask them, it shows. All right, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, exactly. So uh, he can say over and over and over again that he doesn't want to have the power, um, and sort of a similar um, with Harry Potter, for instance, he doesn't yeah. want it. Um, but women and minorities have to fight for the power other- because no one will hand it to them. Yeah. Uh, and men can you say no I don't want it and then still somehow have the power and still uh, get it. yeah uh, uh, but yeah. so Astriel Astriel just he can fight for power and that's expected but if Mrs. Coulter does it then she's power hungry absolutely absolutely and you know there's a um, amazing I, I love sending this uh, this footage to people often it's from the 90s whenever um Bill Clinton was running for president and, you know, that would make um, Mrs. Clinton, the first lady, uh, Hillary Clinton. And there's literally a dude and they're like, so what is it about, you know, Hillary that you, you, you're not supportive and blah, blah, blah. And he goes this and that, like, she seems, she seems like she's really smart and, you know, she's, you know, uh, supportive and I like Bill Clinton, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, but you know, she's just so, um, uh, oh God, what is the word he used? Um, 
ambitious. Like that's a bad thing, you know? Uh, and so uh, there, it, ambition in women is not seen the same way that it is with men. We're seen as bossy. So, um, uh, which is why I like uh, hip hop because there are a lot of hip hop songs by a female artist that's like, I'm a boss ass bitch, you know? <laughs> like they kind of like get into it then, like I'll be a boss then, you know? And I think uh, uh, Beyonce also has a song about, you know, don't call me bossy kind of thing. Um, but uh, actually something below that I really appreciate about Reen in The Poppy War is that she says she wants it and she goes for it. She wants the power. Um, and so um, the audience, please, RF Kwong wrote this series. The first one is called The Poppy War. You seriously need to read it. Uh, they've just greenlit a show to be made. So um, hopefully then after we've made some amazing Poppy War content and there's been a show, people will come back and watch it because... Uh, we're probably not going to have that much of an audience if it's just books. Um, that's just kind of the way it is. It's a show world. It's a movie world. Um, but Reen and the main character in that is not, I don't want it. She goes after it and she does want it. And in many ways, Lyra, right? Yeah. She wants to figure out things about dust. She, she's, she is, of course, should be scared of this new world with the specters and everything. But she wants to know. She doesn't want to be ignorant. And that is what she has in common with her dad, unfortunately, and which is a bad example, but also with Mary Malone, which is a mm -hmm. good example of curiosity and wanting to know and pushing the limits of knowledge, right? And Azriel does that for the bad, and Mary Malone is trying to do it for the good. She wants to talk to dark matter, to dust, um, to try and find out how it can be useful for people. And Azriel wants to get angels on his side so that he could fight the Magisterium. You know, it's a very martial way to look at it. Whereas Mary and I believe Lyra as well. And okay, so you could say like Marissa Coulter, Asriel, martial reason to know about dust, right? Want to fight the Magisterium or in Marissa Coulter's case, just have power in general. And then you have Lyra and Mary Malone, which is why I kind of pair them off uh, and uh, wanting to know about dust in order to better humanity and to better understand these worlds and how they interact and how everyone across the spectrum of worlds can have a better life. Um, and also, of course, Lyra is worried about the Magisterium, but she's not necessarily having this, uh, she's not building a freaking army like her dad, okay? I mean, he's. this is literally the last scene that what he's looking at right there is this army of angels that he's put together. It's a very epic scene and I'm glad they ended this, this season on this, but it's mm. also scary. Because yeah. he has gone to Chitagaze, right? He has, uh, most likely, or he has somehow communicated with the angels uh, who, because we have the Tour de Angeli, we know that they have been to that world. He, But he didn't appreciate this, like, oh boy, new worlds, new knowledge. He's like, awesome, I can kill God with this, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and I think that's... Um... As you can see a similarity, a similar contrast there with Mary and Marissa uh, in how they approach science. Um, and I know I had a discussion with, God, I don't remember who it was, but someone on Girls Gone Cannon's Discord about this. Um, and I'm going to try to not spoil the third book, but uh, both in this season and in the third book, you can see that Mary, when she tries to learn things, she wants to use it for good. And she wants to to, to learn things and help people and not exploit people uh, in yeah. the process. Uh, and she's very aware of research ethics. She doesn't want um, her re research to help the military, we see in this season. Yes. Um, while Marissa is totally fine with exploiting people uh, and she doesn't like we see in season one uh, she yeah. is fine with children dying uh, and in this season she wants to learn from the severed people and she wants to learn to control specters but it's not like she learns to control them and then uses that to help the people in Chitagatse yeah. to like remove them or something. Yeah. Uh, she could, I mean, I don't know if she could do that, but theoretically maybe she could just tell the specters to, hey, follow me around and stop killing people. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, I imagine if Mary was in that situation, she would try to help people. Yeah, she would uh, try to get the specters to just like stop. <laughs> yeah. Right? 
Um, and I think also, Lo, something interesting is, and this continues Philip Pullman's interest in atheism and deism, right? Believing in some form of, of God or gods, um, is that Mary used to be a nun. She right, and now she's a scientist. So you have literally this so-called switch. If we want to look at everything as dual, and I know there are a lot of people that are spiritual that say that you know science is not the enemy of religion. You know they can go together, but you can if you want to look at it as uh, the thing we don't like, which is a binary. But you know of rational thought and then religious thought. She went from one end of the spectrum to the next, right? And um, so, kind of what what do we think that kind of Pullman is doing with her character when it comes to religion there, because Asriel also kind of has a similar, he uses the magisterium's religion like against them, but she has a bit of a respect, I think, for it. She doesn't seem to, she shuns it, but she doesn't seem to have disdain for it, you know? Yeah, I think that uh, Mary's journey in a lot of ways is to go more toward uh, what you said, that synthesis of faith and religion uh, because she realizes in this season uh, that uh, you can't just ignore good and evil uh, when it comes to religion uh, and I'm trying to find a quote um, uh, that I quoted in one of my essays uh, from this season uh, while you're scrolling, I will just say the synthesis yes. of religion and science. Um, she's using a Chinese religious object of the of the the um, uh, aging sticks to talk to dust, right? Uh, which she calls dark matter, which is for her this scientific phenomenon. Mm. So we see that just in that. Yeah, uh, and I found the quote, uh, mm. and uh, yeah, Mary learns that Mrs. Coulter is an experimental theologian, and then she asks. Where would you say theology comes into science? And Mrs. Coulter replies, where does it not? Uh, and on the surface, that is obviously about how the magisterium is involved in science a lot <laughs> in Lyra's world. Like we talked about before, they control what you can research. But I also think on a deeper level, it tells us that obviously theology is involved in science in our world too because the way we conceptualize the world will impact how we do research and what we research. And a lot of um, feminist science uh, critics uh, today would argue that you can never completely remove yourself from the object that you're researching. Um, because how what you expect to find, even if you try to remove yourself, you will always have that that inside of you and how you see the world if you see the world as um i don't know uh from a liberal or from a conservative or from a, a christian or from a hindu or whatever perspective that will influence what you want to research and what you think is possible to research um so i think that what mary wants to do is to completely shut herself off when it comes to research. That's why she went from being a nun, because she didn't want to think about that. But I think that what she will learn is that you can never do that. You you always have to consider good and evil, uh, how your research impacts other people, um, how what preconceived notions you have, and how that impacts your research. Yeah. Um, because, I mean... Uh, a comp like you said, she used as a religious uh, object and a spiritual object in her research, and uh, like strict objective scientists would probably not do that. They would they wouldn't even think about doing that. Uh, yeah. So theology and ideology and everything just it is intertwined with science. Yeah, and I think the impossibility of objectivity is a lot going on here, and also. You know, you mentioned coming from a Christian perspective, a Hindu perspective, I'm Buddhist. So obviously when I look at things, I have some preconceived notions there. But also being atheist, that has preconceived notions as well. If you're a scientist and you find yeah. this phenomena that you can't explain, you automatically don't even consider the divine. So um, that alone is technically shutting yourself off to possibilities. 
so how objective are you really then? Um, you know, and this is not what I'm saying. Like all of our scientists should be religious. It's not what I'm saying. Trust me, it's not what I'm saying. Um, but what I'm saying is that um, preconceived notions, every single person has them. And there, we can get as close to uh, objectivity as we as we can, but subjectivity will always be there. And uh, we should not shut ourselves off to all the possibilities when we are doing research, um, which is something that you and I as um, aspiring academics, uh, hopefully uh, that's, that's the kind of mindset that we go into gender studies um, is to open our mind to all possibilities. Yeah, and just to, like you say, be aware that our subjectivities will impact and try to account for that instead of just ignoring it. Definitely, yeah. Um, but, uh, oh gosh, wow, we talked so much. <laughs> I'm just, I can't, we talked about a lot of really deep things. <laughs> like, instead of being like, well, we were like, oh my God, Red Panda is so cute. But then we're also like, what is life and death? And opportunity? <laughs> and <laughs> so that's great. Um, uh, all right. So is there some, oh, anything else you mentioned you wanted to talk about Azriel? We did that and talked a little bit more about Mary and Marissa and kind of some uh, comparison, compare and contrast there. No, not really. I, I think, I feel like we've covered most of it. Uh, yeah. And yeah, I'm really excited for what they're going to do with season three. Uh, because this season was just so incredible on so it many was. levels. Um, so let's talk about season three then, because are they still going to stick with eight episodes? Because you've read The Amber Spyglass. That is a long book, and he packs a lot more into that than I would say both of the first two combined. So yeah. what? how are they going to, please tell me they're going to do two, 10, se- 10 episodes or 10 seasons. <laughs> please tell me they're going to do 10 episodes or something, because you cannot pack that into eight hours. I don't know, because Jack Forn, who's the executive producer, I think, uh, he's one of the people in charge, anyway, he said that he, based on the, if I remember correctly, he said that they've written six uh, scripts and outlined two more, and he says that it all fits. Um, They they have to be cutting something out. Yeah, I mean, I think... They're gonna shorten some like travel things, maybe. Yeah. Uh, there is a bit of travel in the beginning, for instance, so they may cut down on that. But also, you need. That's something I feel like comes up a lot of times when you talk about like travel log chapters in books, uh, because yeah, they're just traveling, but you need the emotional journey as well. Yes. Uh, and interactions between different people, so I you can't just cut all of it, but. I think they're going to cut some of that, maybe. Uh, But there's a lot of characters that I'm excited to meet that I hope they don't cut too much time from them. I know, there is a certain uh, species or race of people in particular that if they take it out, I'm going to be so mad. Um, They they can take that out. They can't take that out. (laughs) Um, But let's talk about where each character was left, because we had, although, uh, so... Let's start with Serafina because she gets called away by Lee Scoresby and she basically escapes Mrs. Coulter's um, kind of genocide of, of yeah. whatever witches were there, right? She sends basically the specter goes after the, the witch that was uh, protecting Lyra after um, Serafina flew off. So she is uh, technically safe for now. Um, mm-hmm. We have that. Uh, she's so she, you know, went after Lee, who, you know, unfortunately, she's not going to get there in time. Um, but we also have uh, Mrs. Coulter is, you know, without any spoilers for season three is I mean, I think it's pretty obvious she's taking Lyra. She's going to basically kidnap her. She has her in a box. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's uh, or in the bag or something so, like that. Where they're going, we won't say, but, you know, she's taking, yeah. she's, instead of a helping Lyra, she's a taken Lyra. Um, so yeah, and out. I mean, she says, when she found, finds out that Lyra is Eve, she says that she's going to make sure, sure she doesn't fall this time. Yeah. Um, so that seems to be her goal, to somehow, yeah, prevent Lyra from falling and... Um, 
So she obviously still has the idea that sin is bad and original sin is bad and should be prevented, um, which we might argue with. Um, <laughs> might. <laughs> si- since, uh, you know, uh, the serpent is being protected by angels at the moment. Um, yes. But And it's uh, called the tree of knowledge, not the tree of sin. I'm just saying. She went seeking knowledge, technically, that had yeah. been forbidden by God. So there's yeah. a lot of arguments. Um, in um, certain forms of uh, Satanism, which once again is not like, yeah, let's worship Satan. It's looking at the story of Lucifer differently. They also look at the story of Eve differently and that she yeah. actually was choosing, she was the reason that humans have free will, if you want to look at it that way. Um, yeah. But then it's been interpreted as she went against God and therefore that was the first sin was to go against God. Um, whereas you could kind of, in my opinion, see Eve as wanting to think for herself and Adam as a sheep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's, um, uh, there's a really good, um, quote. I don't know if you know of, um, uh, the feminist Sojourner Truth. I don't think so. Uh, she was, uh, Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Sojourner Truth. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's because your J's are, are, are much smoother. And I love it. I love your accent so much. But I was like, no, I've never heard of Sojourner. Oh, Sojourner. Yeah. In, our Amer- in America, we really pronounce our J's. <laughs> yes, yeah, Sojourner. I've been that told I- that I pronounce J's and G's strangely <laughs> to American I mean, people. Um, I, I'm, I'm not going to be too curious about, unless it's Joppery, then I'm not okay with it. But otherwise, it's good. Uh, yeah, but yeah, my point about her, uh, for those who don't know, uh, she was a formerly enslaved uh, black woman in America who h- held a very famous speech at a women's conference. Um, and she argued uh, against uh, both uh, racism and sexism and the structural uh, inequality. But one point she made uh, was that... Um, uh, because some people were arguing that, well, women can't uh, be equal to men because religion, Christianity. And she said, if the first woman God ever made was strong enough to turn the world upside down all alone, these women together ought to be able to turn turn it back and get it right side up again. So, uh, I, I love mean, that. I think, yeah, I love that so much. <laughs> uh, I I think that's maybe something we can see in this story. Uh, women turning it right side up again. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, we're given Lyra is our protagonist. Um, so, you know, uh, the way that the Magisterium sees her as an antagonist um, or as a potential antagonist, we know as the reader, as the viewer, that just like with Dust, they're wrong. Right? Yeah. So we have that. So she's been kidnapped. Um, Will has just seen the sacrifice of his father, right? Um, uh, and he just found his father and kind of like in the books too, had him for like five seconds and then that was it. Um, yeah. So more childhood trauma. Yeah, and I think, um, slight spoiler for the books, I guess, but they changed his death scene, Joe Parr's death scene, um, for the better, I think. Um, but I think it's interesting that they had the Magisterium kill him um because uh, as thought about before the magisterium wants to uh, control knowledge and control um yeah control people uh and they also have this very strong nazi symbolism uh so it's sort of fitting that they would kill uh, a rebel thinker a rebel political leader uh, yeah anyway. and a man who learned beyond what the magisterium had to teach him right? Yeah. He learned from other cultures um, and then was killed for it. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So there's that. Um, Obviously, unfortunately, Lee's journey is over. I'm very sad and angry Mm. about that. Um, Lord Boreal, same thing. Uh, Didn't cry about that at all. Um, But we've got that. Uh, We know that the Panzerbjorn are still there. Um, Just, you know, not as much ice, unfortunately. so let me think yeah we talked about and we talked about seraphina um so i guess asriel is is really the last uh one of the last um that we see uh we get like i said he was kind of present in the um 
uh, season, but not there until later, kind of like, honestly, kind of like Stannis in A Song of Ice and Fire. You hear about him a ton before you see him, but he's a figure that is still kind of on everyone's mind. So, mm. like I said, we have that scene, which I just, I'm, I'm sorry, I put this up so many times, but I just love his facial expression. He kills this character. He's so good at this. Um, yeah. And uh, he is looking at these these really powerful beings and it preparing for a war um, and what the consequences of that are going to be. We'll find out um, in season three, but we know climate is already going to be one. Um, mm. And, you know, another one maybe we can think of too is uh, how is the magisterium going to react if angels are on Azrael's side? Yeah, that's going to be very interesting. Uh I remember I talked with Chloe about this uh, when I was on Girls Gone Canon. Um, we talked about this in their dustiest discussion, uh, which is spoiler, but I'm going to despoil it for you. Um, and I think it, it's from the, from the book's perspective uh, and also looking forward to the Books of Dust, it's very interesting how the Magisterium handles things that go against their beliefs. Uh, and we saw that a bit in the first episode uh, with the old cardinal being like, no, we're just going to ignore the anomaly. It doesn't exist. Uh, and and Father MacPhail, later, later Cardinal MacPhail, was like, but it's there, dude. It's in the middle of the sky. We can't ignore it. Yeah. Uh, so I'm very interested to see how they're going to deal with angels. How they're going to spin, right? Yeah. Spin exactly. the fact that uh, winged and dark beings are on his side. Um, yeah. Also, uh, Lo, what do you think about that glimpse of the angels we get right at the end where they're kind of there, but not really, you know, they're kind of metallic-y, kind of translucent. What, what do you think about that, the design? I thought they looked good. Uh, in the books, it's mentioned that they're very hard to see because they don't have matter, they're just spirit. Yeah. Um, and uh, that, the angels mentioned that when they talked to Mary as well in the cave, uh, that their spirit not matter. Uh, so I thought that looked really good. I know something I was a bit disappointed with in the season was that they had cast two specific angels that were supposed to uh, turn up uh, that are important uh, to the third book, but then they cut that scene from what I understand. And I think, yeah. I think it made sense how they cut it because just shoving that in at the end of the season would be a bit weird. Um, but I wonder how they're going to look. Uh, I'm very excited for yeah, that. Yeah, we got a tease actually in the very first episode with the voiceover, didn't we? Yeah. Because that... I don't, and this is not a spoiler, because if you, like me, watch with the CCs, you would have seen that it's like angel voice. Yeah. And then it narrates, and I'm like, what? <laughs> they're already yeah. doing this? And then to not see them until the very end, I was like, okay, that's that's definitely uh, one of the um, the products of them having to cut some material. Um, so they're yeah. just going to save that for season three. But yeah, we're going to meet some angels, guys. I mean, it, yeah. it, that's obvious from seeing that last episode. You know, that's not at all a spoiler. Um, yay. No. <laughs> I'm excited. I also wonder... Uh if they're going to bring back more characters from Lyra's world. Uh, yeah. Like um, like the Egyptians or some of the scholarly characters. And maybe we're not even going to be that much in Lyra's world for season three because they're just focused on these other worlds. I'm, I'm very excited to see yeah. how they do that. Yeah, and I'm hoping... I want to see they... the Egyptians I, again. And I'm hoping when they do begin production um, that it will be safe and they will be able to uh, do as much as possible. Um, this is yeah. a great time for animation right now because everyone can work from home, but live action stuff, not so much. Um, so I know like one of the shows that I talked about on Monaro Geek Unlimited's channel, The Blood of Zeus, is an animated show and they're already working on season two because everyone mm. just does their voices from home and the animators work from home. But you know, live action, you're really having to jump through some hoops. I know The Witcher, the second season right now is, uh, underway, but it's slower because of all of the precautions that they have to take. So, um, you know, to the cast, I'm sure you're watching this. We, we hope you're uh, safe and um, yeah. that, you know, it's smooth, but not rushed because, uh, because safety is the most important. Um, awesome. Yeah, I'm so excited for season three. Um, is there anything more you want to talk about? 
No, I don't think so. I'm very excited how they're going to wrap up these themes about religion and yes. power. Yes. Um, they really need they... the Magisterium stuff this season. Yeah. Yeah. So it's an amazing season. I'm so impressed with everything they did and how they managed to, yeah, bring, bring depth to the depth to things uh, I didn't expect. Uh, and yeah, it's amazing <laughs> all around. I just can't get over finally. Panda! The red panda. <laughs> the red panda. And it's so cute. And like you said, the facial expressions on the... Uh, on the demons finally really got me like they yeah. it felt more real we know that cgi but really immersing us into the um into the this the world is is much more this season and it's another minor thing but i thought that the the poster for the season was better mm. too the last one felt a little choppy and this one i feel like it all comes together you've got the tower you've got the angel wings Everyone's with their demons, all the main people. Um, I, yeah. you know, you've got um, Lee's balloon going into the other world in the top left. Um, there's the witches hiding behind the angel wings. Um, I think I, that... I, I think it was just... that Small things like that got me really hyped for the season, and then it totally paid off the hype. Yeah. I think uh, where Lee is, is supposed to be Lake Inara, uh with a tree. Um hmm with a balloon um but uh whatever i don't know maybe <laughs> not. uh i have a lot of thoughts about trees that we don't have time to cover <laughs> come back for a whole for a whole recording about trees well yes <laughs> tree talk um okay cool um i'm gonna do some plugs and then have yeah. you talk uh once again plug your content um but I'm going to be on January 1st, uh, Manaro Geek Unlimited. She has these things called ginger ale chats, and you have to catch them live because they get deleted afterwards because we get raunchy. We talk about all sorts of things. So last time I watched, we were talking about sex toys. So <laughs> this is going to be my first time being on the ginger ale chat. I'm ready to get wild with my bad self. So check that out. That's going to be January 1st at uh, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, it's kind of like an after hour stream uh, in the chat. You can talk about whatever you want. It gets really fun. Um, and like I said, it's only up for a couple of hours. So you really do have to catch it live. But Monaro is amazing. She has some great content. Uh, I was just on her channel a couple weeks ago with Nessie to talk about uh, the blood of Zeus. So please check out that. I'm going to go ahead and put that uh, the link to her channel down in the description. Always on 7 p.m. Eastern, John Webster Film. We are talking about Wonder Woman 1984, and then I'm going to stream three days in a row, though. It's going to be real fun. Sunday, I'm going to be on Here Be Dragons. We're going to talk about Yennefer from The Witcher. We're going to talk about the show specifically, so if you haven't read the books, don't worry. Come and talk about show Yennefer, uh, and she is my favorite character from The Witcher, so I'm very excited for that. And I said at the top all the stuff I have coming up for my channel, so I will leave it there for what's coming in 2021, but we will have low back, don't you worry. Um, so, Lo, once again, uh, they can find you at your WordPress, which is lothelinks.wordpress.com. And, uh, yeah, so tell us a little bit about what you've already been putting up HDM-wise and what you've got coming up. Yeah, so uh, like I mentioned at the top, uh, I've analyzed uh, all of the episodes this season, except episode one, because I did that with Girls Gone Canon. Uh, and then I also have a bunch of other uh, essays up. Uh, one about colonialism. I have a lot about uh, the Nordic influences uh, of uh, historic materials. That's where I sort of started off because uh, I'm from Sweden and I found a lot of interesting things uh, correlating to Scandinavian history. And I have also written about Scandinavian folklore and how that correlates to the witches and I've written about femininity in historic materials and a bunch of different things um, so check that out that's book spoilery I generally don't spoil uh, the book of dust if I do I'm gonna warn you before that but all the books otherwise uh, are, spoiler are spoiled in the essays so uh, yeah, be aware. Um, and then, like I mentioned, I'm going to write about moving through unspace unsafe spaces as a marginalized person in historic materials. 
uh, next. And uh, yeah, I'm probably going to write something about demons soon too. I, I feel like that's been brewing for a while. Yes, um, definitely. But I also cover uh, A Song of a Fire a lot. Uh, I have a bunch of essays there. Uh, a lot relating to gender and transgender, etc. Uh, and uh, sexuality, disability, a bunch of different stuff. Um, so check that out. I also have some random other stuff uh, that I sometimes feel like writing about. For instance, uh, our friend uh, Grant Piercy has an amazing book series called Their Waste uh, that I've written about um, because uh, it's amazing. Is that um, Heathen King on Twitter? Yeah, Heathen King on on Twitter, gotcha. exactly. Uh, so that's a cyberpunk story about a near future with a much more authoritarian regime and uh, also what makes us human compared to technology and um, there's uh, robots and stuff. Uh, it's I'm very, so very exciting. I and that's uh, on my to read list. Yeah, so the first book is called The Raised and the second one is called uh, Agent of Truth. Uh, and it's very interesting when it comes to yeah, gender, sexuality, what makes us human, um, etc. Awesome. That is so exciting, Lo. Um, yes, please check out their blog. Um, I'm going to put that up there just one more time. The link is in the description. But um, like I said, they I was a fan of them before I was their friend. I'm glad to be their friend, but I'm still a fan. So <laughs> Uh, check out their blog. Uh, they've got a lot of great stuff going on. Um, but Lo, thank you once again. You're my most returning guest. And I, I let's keep it that way because I love having you on. Uh, we have so many um, of the same interests and we both have an academic background. So I really appreciate talking to you. Um, and yeah, we will um, see you next time. And thank you everyone for watching.